chapter 42. And we're going to see in chapter 42 is we're going to see Joseph's reunion with his brothers. Now, let's do a little recap. What's happened? What, is, what has Mike taught us so far about the life of Joseph? Well, first of all, Joseph was in a dysfunctional family. Uh, you know, we hear about dysfunctional families. His family was dysfunctional. Uh, and part of the reason why his family was dysfunctional was his dad, Jacob, favored Joseph. Remember back in Genesis when Mike was teaching earlier that, uh, that uh, the father favored Joseph to the point that Joseph was given a special coat by his dad. What was the coat? A multicolored coat. And it showed his favoritism towards Joseph to the point that his brothers hated Joseph because his dad favored him so much. And so what happened was, we see, remember in the story of Joseph, that uh, his brothers developed this hatred for him to, uh, to such a point that, remember, they, 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 tried, they were going to kill him. Now, a part of the problem with Joseph, if you look at his life, was that he wasn't really smart as a teenager. Now, you don't tell your older brothers about a dream. Remember the dream he had? And the dream was uh, these stocks were bowing down to the other stocks, and it was talking about him being the one that all the stocks were bowing down to, and the implication was, brothers, one day you're going to bow down to me, and you're going to be at my feet bowing down to me. Now, that's not a good thing to tell your older brothers, and it led to a lot more dysfunction. And then his dad favored him to the point that he had him overseeing what his brothers were doing, watching the sheep, and he was going to oversee his older brothers. Now, I never had an older brother. I'm kind of glad I didn't have an older brother because I was the kind of kid growing up, if I had an older brother, I would have gotten beat up a lot. But I can't imagine being an older brother and then having this younger brother, he was the second youngest kid in the family, coming and checking up on me. And that's what happened. And if you remember the story in Genesis, as he was checking up on them for his dad, they threw him in a pit. And they're going to kill him. But Reuben, one of his, the oldest brother in the family, rescued him and said, don't kill him, just throw him into slavery. And so as these slave traders were coming by, they threw him in a pit. As these slave traders were coming by, they threw Joseph into slavery. Joseph at that time was only about 17 years old. And he was thrown into slavery and he was brought to this foreign land, the land of Egypt. But, which, by the way, was the, the most powerful nation in the world. And he's a slave at Potiphar's house, remember in Genesis, uh, earlier in Genesis, he's in Potiphar's house, who was the, 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 guy, the guy that watched over the Roman guard, or the Pharaoh's guard. And so he was a top soldier, and he was wealthy as the, one of the top soldiers for Pharaoh. And so Joseph, for a number of years, was a servant for this Potiphar, who was kind of like one of Pharaoh's generals. And so as he served, it says in the Scripture, I love the character of Joseph, because it says about Joseph in the Scriptures that God was with him even in his slavery as Potiphar's slave. And God was not only with him, God blessed him to the point that Potiphar saw this young servant boy had this blessing on his life and said, I'm going to put him in charge of everything. And he became the main servant in Potiphar's house. And he was in charge of the whole household of Potiphar. But then Potiphar's wife, if you remember in the story, had a thing for Joseph. And she started seducing him. But the thing about Joseph, it's amazing in his character. Teenager, probably only 18, 19, 20 years old, and this wealthy wife is saying to him repeatedly, lie with me, lie with me. Lie with me. And you know what he did? He did what Paul said to do. Flee, flee youthful lusts. And he re- it got to the point that she finally grabbed him one time. Lie with me. And he ran out of there so quick. He got out of Dodge so quick. She, she, took, she took his coat and he just said, you can have it. I'm out of here. And at that point she was uh, so ashamed. She took his coat and she told her husband he tried to rape me. And then he was put from the slavery to the prison. Now, I believe that Potiphar knew Joseph's character to the point that he probably knew it wasn't Joseph raping his wife. He probably knew his his wife was involved in just lying about it because he knew his wife and he knew Joseph. Why do I say that? Because 
Potiphar had the right with his slave, if the slave raped his wife, he had a right, and he probably would have, if he really thought that happened, to kill that slave. Slave, Slaves were just property. If a slave raped your wife in that culture, you'd kill him. He didn't kill him. He sent him to prison. And so now he ends up going from being a slave to being a prisoner. You know what the Bible says about him? It says in the midst of being in prison, God was with him. And it doesn't say any time in Joseph's life that, that Joseph walked away from God. No matter whether it was th- being thrown in slavery by his brothers, no matter it was being falsely accused of rape that he never did, no matter it was stuck in prison, he, didn't, he, he never walked away with God, from God. And the Bible says repeatedly, and God was with him, and God blessed him. So now he's in prison, and as he's in prison, there's two of the, the Pharaoh's servants. One was a baker, and the other was a butler. Remember? And the baker and the butler were in trouble. I think that a, a part of what, what might have been going on was that they might have had some conspiracy threats against them that they were trying to you know, poison or something, the Pharaoh. And so um, they had dreams. The baker and the butler both had dreams. Remember this? And, and the first dream was interpreted by Joseph because Joseph said, I can interpret that dream for it. And he interpreted the dream of the baker and the butler. And the butler actually was first. And he said, you're going to be like in, three, in a certain amount of days, you're going to be go, like back in the palace. You're going to be forgiven of everything and you're going to be out of, out of jail. And then the baker says, well, interpret my dream. And he said, well, a little bit different with you. You're going to, the, those birds that are eating from your head, that's because you're going to be killed and executed by Pharaoh. Sure enough, dream comes true. And then Joseph said to the butler, when you get out of here, based on my dream, tell the Pharaoh about me and get me out of this place. Well, remember what happened? He didn't remember Joseph at all. He just knew he was out of the place. And he didn't even tell the Pharaoh or anybody else about this, this Hebrew boy that was able to interpret his dreams. And several years go by, and then the Pharaoh... <laughs> Pharaoh has a dream in the middle of the night, and none of his, magi- none of his magicians could interpret his dream, and, and no, none of the servants could interpret the dream, and the Pharaoh wanted his dream interpreted. And then the butler finally, ding, ding, said, well, I, this was several years ago, but I was in your prison, Pharaoh, and there was a guy in there that had this ability to interpret dreams. And Pharaoh said, bring him here. And they brought him to Pharaoh. And he said, I hear you can interpret dreams. And Joseph said, no, I can't. I can't do that. But my God can. And you give me the dream, and my God will give you interpretation for that dream. And the dream was these these seven cows that were strong and big and healthy cows. And then after that, there's these seven skinny cows. And the seven skinny cows ate up the healthy cows. And the Pharaoh couldn't figure out what this dream was about. And Joseph said, probably prayed about it, and God gave him interpretation of the dream. And Joseph said, here's the interpretation, Pharaoh. There's the seven healthy cows. Is, it's coming up right now. There's going to be seven healthy, prosperous, great years for Egypt, and you're going to be wealthy with such prosperity, it's going to overflow. But then after those seven years, here's what's going to happen. Those seven skinny cows are going to eat up the healthy cows, represent seven years of famine. And here's what you need to do, Pharaoh. You need a surplus and save during the seven years of plenty. So when the skinny cows that represent the seven years of famine come, you'll be okay. And it it just rang true with his spirit. And Pharaoh said, put him in charge. And then Joseph went from being a slave and a prisoner to the second under Pharaoh. And he became basically the prime minister running the whole program of distribution of of food during the famine, and the barns were overflowing with all this food because he had the wisdom to get Pharaoh to surplus for those seven years, and he had plenty. When when the whole rest of the world was starving, Egypt had plenty because of Joseph's wisdom and discernment, and that takes us to this chapter. You got it? All right, let's jump right in. Chapter 42, if you're there, say amen. amen. Amen? Amen. Here we go. Chapter 42, verse 1. Now Jacob saw there was grain in Egypt, back in the promised land. He's back in Canaan. He said, there's, there's grain in Egypt. And Jacob said to his sons, why are you staring at one another? 
<laughs> here's, here's the deal. During a famine, they're starving, and the brothers, all, all, all 11 brothers of Joseph are just looking at each other going, oh. Now, I'm hoping they weren't looking at each other going, if this gets really bad, I'm going to eat that one. I mean, one of the brothers' name was, names was Reuben. That'd be bad. <laughs> a Reuben sandwich, you get it? <laughs> so they're staring at one another. I think they're more just a, a, a paralysis of analysis. They're going, we're starving to death, and there's no food, and there's no crops. Everything's in a famine, and we're all going to die. And so what does dad do? He says, he kicks them in the rear end and says, stop it. Stop staring at one another. Do this. And by the way, dads, that's what we're supposed to do, by the way. If your fa family gets in a crisis, your family gets in a famine, your family gets into a situation where it seems like all is lost, don't just sit around staring in a paralysis of analysis. Do something, man. Dads, we're supposed to be leaders. We're supposed to lead our families, even through crises. And the, one of the ways you can lead is take initiative. There's way too many dads today that are deadbeat dads that aren't doing nothing when their family's in crisis, and you need to do whatever it takes to get your family out of crisis. Amen? Way too many dads today that aren't doing what they need to be doing to get their families out of crises. So Jacob says, do something, guys. Let's get going here. You're staring at one another. And he says in verse 2, and he said, and behold, I've heard that there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some food for us from that place so that we might live and not die. Now, they're all the way, 260 miles away in Israel, and Egypt's a long journey, but already word of mouth, Jacob had heard. The one place where it's not a famine is Egypt. There's one place in the world where food is available. It's Egypt. So sons, go. Interesting. He doesn't send his servants. Who does he send? His sons. The reason why in that culture, if you were going to an important person in high places, you don't want to send your servants. That was an insult. You'd send your family. So he's sending his family. He's sending his sons, 260 miles across all this land to Egypt. And then it says, then, ten, then the ten brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob didn't send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, I'm afraid that harm may befall him. So there's 11 brothers left, 10 are sent by, uh, by, by Jacob, but one is left behind. Who's the one that's left behind? Benjamin. Benjamin was the brother of Joseph. Uh, Jacob had four wives. His favorite wife, the wife he truly loved, was Rachel. And Rachel just had two sons. Who are the two sons? Joseph and Benjamin. He'd already lost Joseph. He ain't going to lose Benjamin. And Benjamin was the runt. What do I mean by that? He was the youngest son. Joseph was the second youngest son. But this is the baby of the family. It's the baby ain't going. All the rest of you boys, you go. You can risk your lives. But the baby's staying right here. And so he, he, he's, he's demanding that Benjamin stays. And Benjamin stays behind. And interesting, too, in verse 4, he says, I'm afraid that harm may befall him. He's already lost Joseph. He doesn't want to see that repeated again with this youngest Benjamin. You know, sometimes fear can, can afflict us as a family too, can't it? Sometimes accidents or crises in our past could put us in a paralysis also. And, I, and, and, and even in this virus thing we're going through, there's a lot of people that are in paralysis of fear. But what do we have as Christians? We don't have a spirit of fear that leads to, you know, to slavery. We have a spirit of sonship by which we cry out, Abba, Father, the Bible says we're not supposed to have a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Amen? And this virus, it's, it's bad. I, we're not going to be in ignorance. We're not going to be in denial about it. But we're also not going to be in a paralysis of fear because a virus is afflicting our world right now. We need to live with, 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 with faith instead of fear, especially in the times we're in. And he's living in fear right now because he's already lost Joseph. He's keeping the younger one home. Now it says in verse 5, So the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those who were coming, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was a ruler over the land. He was the one who sold all the people, all the land. See his position of prominence? And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down to him, their faces to the ground. Interesting. This is 
20 some years after his dream. And his dream was that he was his going to be the big stock and, the, and his brothers going to be the other stocks and those stocks are going to bow down to him. Guess what's happening? They're bowing down to him just like the dream. By the way, sometimes dreams don't happen overnight. Sometimes God will give you a dream about something and, 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 and a goal about something and something that, that you feel like God's given to, for you to do and it's not happened yet and you think it's never going to happen. That's not true. God's timetable is sometimes not our timetable. Sometimes it takes 20 years. Sometimes it takes 30 years. And this is happening now, but, but it took, he, he was through prison and slavery before his dream came true. We need to just trust in God's timetable. I'm speaking to myself and preaching to myself right now too because I want things yesterday. I, I want things yesterday. But sometimes God's timetable and sometimes God's delays are not God's denials, right? It's God's timing. We've got to trust in that timing. And now this dream of Joseph is coming true. His, his brothers are coming and bowing down to him. And listen, he's the second most important person in the whole world. I mean, he had his, I'm sure he had his own chariot. It probably had like a little Mercedes-Benz sign on the side. No, I'm just kidding. But, I mean, it was a, he, I mean, he had a souped-up chariot probably, and he had people that would just bow down to him, not only his brothers, but the whole culture, because he was like the prime minister of Egypt. And he goes from a, from a prison to a place of prominence. Now, I want you to see something here, too. Joseph, just like David in the Old Testament, is a type of Christ, He's a type. Most, most Bible scholars would say there's typology in the life of Joseph. How is Joseph a type of Christ? Well, first of all, he's his father's favorite son. What's Jesus? He's the only begotten son, the beloved son of our Heavenly Father. Now, we're all sons and daughters adopted for Christians into his family, but Jesus, he's the beloved, begot, only begotten son of God. Another type of, of Joseph that points to Christ is Joseph was despised by his own brothers and his own brothers tried to kill him initially. What did Jesus face when he came to this world with his Jewish brethren? Despised. Crucify him. Kill him. The type of, Joseph, the type of Christ is Joseph because he was despised by his brothers and his brothers were out to kill him. Interesting also, the brothers are now bowing down to, G to Joseph. What's ultimately going to happen to the Jewish nation with Jesus Christ? When the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, all of Israel will be saved. And when Christ comes back, according to Philippians chapter 2, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you see the typology there? So this, this Joseph in the Old Testament is a type, and he's pointing to what's going to happen also with Jesus Christ. Typology. Now let's, let's go on. Verse 7. And when Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he disguised himself to them and spoke to them harshly. And he said to them, where have you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. Now, now question. This, this is his brothers. How does his brothers not recognize him? I mean, this, they grew up with this kid. How, how does he stand right before them and they don't have a clue that that's her brother? Now, answer. This is 20-some years later. Joseph was a teenager. And in that culture, also, when you had reached a place of prominence, oftentimes you would uh, grow like, you remember, have you seen pictures of like King Tut and stuff? You'd have these big beards. And you'd have a whole different probably appearance than he, when he was a 17-year-old. I, I, could, I could show you some pictures of me when I had hair and I was 17 years old. And you'd say, who was that? It's my 17-year-old pictures don't look like me right now. A lot different. A lot different. And so there's a very good chance he's, he's probably about 38 years old here. The last time his brothers saw him, he was 17. He probably had a long beard as a Part of, the, part of the prominent position that he was in, he looked totally different. And we see that. A beard's going to make you look different too. I think of our maintenance uh, staff person, Jason Corley. When, he, when he's got a beard and then when he shaves that thing, who is that? It's, it's very similar. It's a different look. 
And so it's, it's, they, they didn't recognize him because this is 20-some years later. He's a grown, older man instead of a 17-year-old. But Joseph, verse 8, had recognized his brothers, although they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he had about them. He said, you are spies. You've come to look at the undefended parts of our land. Now, why did he say that about his brothers? I think that there was some payback going on here a little bit. I mean, these guys threw him in a pit and then sold him to slavery, and he's seeing them bow down before him. He goes, I'm a, I, I, I'm a little bit of payback here. I'm going to let these guys sweat this a little bit. I'm going to put, put some, some fear in them. And, and I know vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, but I'm going to do a little repaying right now. And he's going to scare them. And, and he's paying back just a little bit. And they said, then they said, no, Lord, my Lord, we're, we're just servants. Verse 10, come to buy some food. We're all sons of one man. And we're honest men. I wonder what Joseph was thinking right there. Honest men? What would you tell our dad after you said that I died? Oh, honest men? Really? Isn't it funny how people that even in the world, even Christians sometimes, have a wrong perception of the level of our depravity? We always think we're a little bit better than we are. And we need to remember, we're not, we're, the heart is deceitful and des desperately wicked. And the right perception that we're supposed to have of ourselves is we're not all that. We're sinners only saved by the amazing grace of God. And the more we remember that we're just sinners saved by God's grace, the more we're going to stay in a place of humility rather than pride and arrogance. And one of the things we're going to have in heaven is we're going to be so struck by the lamb who was slain, and we're going to see his scars for the rest of eternity, and it's going to keep us humble in heaven. A part of uh, the, the greatness of heaven is there's not going to be a, all these boastful, arrogant people in heaven. We're all going to be humbled by the magnitude of his grace when we get to heaven, and it will keep us humble for the rest of eternity. Honest men, come on. That's not true. Your servants are not spies. That's true. Yet, he says in verse 12, he said, No, but you've come to look at the undefended parts of our land. But they said, Your servants are twelve brothers in all, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is with our father. No one is more. And Joseph said to them, It is as, you, it is as I said to you, you're spies. He's putting, the, putting some more on them a little bit more. By this you will be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place until your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you that he may get your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested, whether there's truth or not in you. But if not, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison for what? Three days. And I bet you he didn't tell them he was going to let them out in three days either. They're stuck in prison. And they're probably thinking, is this guy going to, he's called us spies. Is he going to kill us? Now I want you to see a principle here. The Bible says in Galatians, book of Galatians, you reap what you sow. The way the world puts it, what goes around, comes around. And you know what? They're reaping some of what they've sown here with Joseph. That's why Jesus said in the Beatitudes, he said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive what? Mercy. And if you want people to be merciful towards you, then you better be merciful towards other people. And if you want people to be kind to you, the Bible says be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you, then you be a person of kindness and forgiveness too. But if you're, if you're a person of anger and bitterness, and hatred towards people, what goes around is going to come around. And so they're getting, some, they're getting some backlash here. They're spending three days in prison for nothing doing wrong because what goes around comes around, and some uh, justice is being brought by Joseph to his brothers. Verse 18, Now Joseph said to them on the third day, Do this and live, for I... Notice what Joseph said. This is interesting. He says, I what? Fear... What? God. Now, the, why is that interesting? Because the Egyptians didn't just have one God. They were polytheistic. What does that mean? They worshiped hundreds of gods. So what is Joseph doing here saying, I fear one God? 
He's giving a little hint to his brothers. He said, can you see beyond this beard a little bit? Do you remember who I am? I think he's, 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 he's giving a, a, just a subtle hint to his brothers. I fear, just like you, I fear singular one God. And he's trying to give some revelation to his brothers here, I believe. And then it goes after he says, I fear God. Verse 19, if you're honest men, let one of your brothers be confined in your prison. But as for the rest of you, go carry grain for the famine of your households and bring your youngest brother to me so your words may be verified and you will not die. And they did so. Now, youngest brother, that's Benjamin again, who was left behind because Jacob demanded that the youngest stay behind. And what's interesting here is when, when Joseph was thrown into the pit, his youngest brother, based on Genesis, his younger brother was only three years old. Now this is 20-some years later. He's in his mid-20s now, and Joseph says, I want to see my younger brother. So you take this food home to your dad, and then this other guy, other brother's going to stay here. You'll get him back when you bring the youngest brother back. And he, and, and he says, I want to see my little brother who was a preschooler when I was thrown into prison, who's now an adult. And Joseph is just excited about seeing him, I, I'm sure, no doubt about it. And so they did so. Then verse 21 says, And then they said to one another, Truly, we're guilty concerning our brother, because we saw the distress of his soul. Now this is reflecting back 20-some years. And when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered. Now Reuben uh, answered, he's the oldest brother who tried to rescue Joseph, by the way, too. It says, Reuben answered them saying, what did he say? Did I not tell you guys so? <laughs> Don't you hate that when you make a major mistake or failure? You got a relative that says, I told you so. And he says, didn't I tell you so? Do not sin against the boy. And, he, and, you, and you would not listen. Now comes the reckoning for his blood. And they do not know, however, that Joseph understood, for there was an interpreter between them. And he turned away from them and wept. Joseph, Joseph's hearing them speak in their Hebrew. They didn't know he, he even knew Hebrew. And he heard this conversing about how they felt guilty about what they did to Joseph. Joseph hears that, and he turns around, and he has to go away from them. And he's crying because he's realizing his brothers are somewhat repentant here about what they had done to him. And it says, he turned away from them, and he wept. But when he returned to them and spoke to them, he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Now, what's going on with the brothers here? This is 20-some years later. And they're still dealing with the guilt of what they did to Joseph. You know, one of the reasons why we're created in God's image, why we're different than animals, is if you're a human being, according to the book of Romans, you have a moral conscience. Even if you're not a, a believer, you still, created in God's image, have a moral conscience. And you know what the job of the moral conscience is? When you do wrong, the moral conscience that we're given, stamped in the image of God, is to make us feel guilty. Why? So that guilt will lead us to sorrow that will lead us to repentance. I was dealing with something the other night. It wasn't a major deal, it was a minor deal, but it was something that was just getting in my conscience, something I was concerned about. And I, I, I got woken up like about 4.30 in the morning and I had to pray. And, and, and by that next day I worked through it and everything else and fortunately it was good and everything was resolved and stuff, but it was one of those things that reminded me as I woke up at 4.30 in the morning and had to pray about it and stuff like that is, I, thank you Lord for the conscience you've given me. Because it's a moral compass that keeps me on track. It helps me, helps me to deal with living in the right way. I heard one commentator put it this way, that the moral conscience that we have as human beings, it's the sundial of the soul. I like that. It, it keeps, us, keeps us dialed in to how we're supposed to live and what we're supposed to do. And one of the things that Satan wants to do to us is take away our conscience. Have you heard the term sociopath or, or psychotic? Those are psychological terms for people that have lost their conscience. They'll do things and they don't even feel bad about things. They'll do horrendous things and they don't even feel bad about it because the Bible says that if you keep going against your conscience, go against your conscience, going against your conscience, what you could do is you could 
callous your conscience. Now, what's a callous? It's, 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 it's you get so callous to doing right or do the wrong thing that happens, you don't even feel the pain anymore of doing the wrong thing. You're calloused. Another, another term that's used in the Bible is you seared your conscience. You burned it. And one of the things we got to be careful with as Christians is to keep short accounts with God. What does that mean? When you do something wrong, confess your sins, and he'll be faithful and just, and he will forgive you, and then he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then you repent, and you get back on track with walking with God, and then you're not searing or callousing your conscience anymore. You're getting back on track. Does that make sense? And so keep a soft conscience. Keep open to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And then when you're convicted about something, confess it and repent and get back on track again. Otherwise, you can get a callous or a seared conscience. We don't want that. We want to stay, we want to stay soft hearts, not calloused hearts. Amen? That's, that's a part of walking with God. And the grace is always there. God's grace, according to Ephesians 2, is rich. God is rich in grace. He's, he's rich in mercy, Ephesians 2 tells us. But we need to run to that grace when we do wrong things. Confess it, repent of it, and get back on track. Repent, get back on track so we don't get calloused or seared consciences. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 Verse 25. Then Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to restore every man's money in his sack, and to give them provisions for their journey. And thus it was done for them. And so they loaded their donkeys with grain, departed from there. And as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw the money, and behold, it was in the mouth of his sack. Look what his brothers say now. Then as he said to his brothers, my money has been returned, and behold, it's in my sack. And what happened? Their hearts sank, and they turned trembling to one another, saying, what is this that God is done to us. Here's what's going on. They've gone for food. They gave them money for all the food. And then Joseph pulls another one on them. He puts the money back in their sacks. And now they're going away and they see this money in the sacks. They're going, We're going to be accused of stealing from the second most powerful man in the world. We are dead meat and we're never going to go back to Egypt ever again. But they're going to go back because they're going to get famine again and they're going to starve again and they're going to have to go back and face the same guy that they know probably will accuse them of stealing from them because all the money's back in the sack. And so they say, what has God done to us now? That's what happens when we live in guilt and we live in deception and we do wrong things. Those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and you know what? One of the good things about our relationship with God is he is not going to let us get away with our dirty stuff. Discipline's coming, man. Because those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. So they're coming under the discipline here now. Verse 29. And when they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man of the Lord of the land spoke harshly with us, and he took us for spies in the country. But we said to him, We're honest men. We're not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is with our father today in the land of Canaan. And the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, By this I shall know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me, take grain for the famine of your households, and go. But bring your youngest brother to me, that I may know that you are not spies, but honest men. And I will give your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. Now it came about as they were emptying their sacks, that behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were dismayed, said, we are in trouble. And their father Jacob said to them, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you would take Benjamin. All these things are what? Against me. Now, do you see where Jacob's at in his life right now? Saying, I've lost my favorite son, Joseph. And And he was told that Joseph had died. Now, you're saying, I need to get, to get back my other son, Simeon, who's in jail in Egypt. I need to send my youngest son to get back my other son? And then he said, in all things in life, they're against me. Now, is this true? No. What's going to happen shortly after this when the sons return? Joseph is going to reveal himself to his brothers. 
And not only is he going to reveal himself to his brothers, he's going to say, and go get the rest of the family and bring them back here. Get them out of the famine, and I will give you your own land in Goshen, and you will be treated with all the royal privileges I have, and you're going to be blessed beyond measure. And they were because of Joseph's position. And so blessing is right around the corner for Jacob. But what's Jacob's view? Jacob's view is all the things in life are all against against me. And I understand. He lost his son. He thought he did, at least. His favorite son, his, the brothers said, were killed. And now he's about to have to sacrifice his other favorite son by getting to get Simeon back. And all in life is against me. But you know what? We can have that attitude sometimes, too. And I've had that attitude before when life is tough. And when, when that comes upon us, that kind of attitude, you know what we need to do? We need to get back in the Word. We've got to stay in fellowship. We've got to get the support system that we need in place. And realize, no, everything in life isn't against us because God is for us. And one of the things I love about Joseph, and I'm trying to learn even studying today about Joseph, is that no matter what life threw at him, he knew that God was with him. And he knew that God was for him. Whether he was stuck in the best years of his life in his 20s in prison or in slavery, he knew God was with him and he knew God was for him and he knew ultimately God was going to bless him and he did. And we need to keep that in mind too. We need to keep that in mind that no matter what life throws at us, God is with us, God is for us, and ultimately God is going to bless us. And in a moment, 1 Corinthians 15 says, in a twinkling of an eye, when the rapture happens, we're going to be changed. We're going to go from being mortal people to immortal people, imper perishable pe or to perishable people to imperishable people, and we're going to see him as he is, and we too will be like him. And listen, Christian, we need to remember Christ in us. I need to remember Christ in me, hope of glory. The best is yet to come, man. And even if we've lost people, and some of us have, I, I've lost my grandparents, my earthly parents, I've lost people in this ministry that I love and I hold dearly. Some of my best friends I've lost in the last 10 years. But you know what? They were believers. And I'm going to see them again. And I'm going to walk those streets of gold with some of my friends that have gone before me. And they just got promoted before I did. And I need to remember the best is yet to come. And you need to remember, life isn't against you. God is with you. God is for you. And the best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. Let's not get into Jacob mode. Let's stay in a Joseph mode. I got to stay in a Joseph mode. You got to stay in a Joseph mode. The Joseph no mode is no matter how bad it gets, we remember God is with us, God's for us, and the best is yet to come. The Jacob mode is, oh, life is against me. Everything's bad. Woe is me. Don't go there. Let's stay in the Joseph mode. Amen? Amen? Joseph mode is faith. And what's faith? It's an assurance of things hoped for. It's a conviction of things not yet seen. Let's walk in faith. Faith. Amen? Amen. Amen. Faith. Verse 37. Then Reuben spoke to his father saying, You may put my two sons to death if I do not bring them back to you, but put them in my care and I'll return him to you. So Reuben said, hey, you could, <laughs> this is a stupid thing, by the way. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Grandpa. He's saying, well, Reuben, he's, he, what he's saying here is Reuben said, hey, let's do this thing, and if, if, if I don't bring back your, your youngest son to you, you could kill my, my two sons, but those are his grandsons. How would that help anything? <laughs> Just not being logical, Reuben. Okay. Verse 38, but Jacob said, my son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he alone is left. If harm should befall him on the journey you're taking, then you'll bring my ha gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. And so what he's basically saying, ain't happening. You're not bringing the youngest son. We're just going to hang this, you know. But very next chapter, we're going to see next time we get together in two weeks, we're going to see that Jacob gives into this because... They got in a famine moan again, and all the food ran out, and so he's going to send them back. But then when we get back in that in two weeks, it's going to be wonderful. It's a wonderful story of restoration, forgiveness, and families coming together again and getting over their issues. And we'll see that when we get into Joseph, part two of this story of reuniting with his brothers. Amen?